you've got somebody who is being photographed by this mechanical process which shows them in different positions of their head, their face, their body, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and therefore, in a sense, shape-shifting to some degree. Mm -hmm. They're not always the same person, they don't always have the same mm -hmm. ideas, values, attitudes, mm -hmm. or whatever it feelings, or yes, whatever it is. Move these round, little spools, little piece of paper around it, glued around it. We take that off. Put that back in. Run the film under that first roller there. That's the thing that senses whether it's a film in there or not. Turn it round just a sec so we can run that through to the middle of the reel. Shut the back. It makes a click. And then wind on until you feel a little click again. And there we are. That's the first frame. Put it back on the tripod. And there we are, ready to go. Uh, we might try a multiple exposure portrait of Paul. Much as we assume Deakin would have done it, my assumption would be that Deakin was actually using a tripod for this. You're then going to get some idea of what's going to happen by the movement of the, of the head or the body or whatever it is, the subject. There are very few with blurs in the portrait. The only one I felt that perhaps that wasn't the case, it looks like the camera is probably being held Steady, and he's taking two images handheld. What I'm going to do is take a first exposure, and then a second, and then a third. So what we need to do is to take our meter reading again. If we weren't deep in, we'd take our meter reading, and we see, yeah, it hasn't changed. Again, it's about an eighth of a second at 5.6. Now, then you have to think about what the film is doing. Okay, so when you are taking the exposure, the first of the three exposures, if we're going to do a three-part multiple exposure, you need to break down the exposures into their parts. They'll make one full exposure. You've then got to take basically a creative decision. Do I want to have the multiple exposure with a one dominant image and then a couple of lighter ones which almost give it like a semi-ghost-like effect? Or do I want all three to be more or less at the same level? We've metered it at an eighth of a second, but that would be for a single image. So if we did three exposures at a thirtieth of a second, broadly speaking, we're going to end up with one exposure at an eighth of a second, okay. effectively an eighth of a second. Yeah. I'm going to set that to 5.6 to give myself a little bit of depth of field and to an eighth of a second. Now, it's possible we're going to get a little bit of movement, but actually that's not too much of a worry. Deakin working in a daylight studio, which I think he probably was, judging by a lot of the photographs that are made of this sort, he's got quite a lot of light coming down on the subject. He's got reflectors as well to reflect in the sorts of effects he was doing he probably would also have probably slightly overdeveloped the film. In other words, the film has a speed, a certain sensitivity to light, and he's assuming that it has about half the sensitivity that is stated on the box. The reason for that is that you get more detail then into the negative, and then when you print it, you can get what people call a punchier negative, mm -hmm. which is more contrasty, more sort of sharper look to it. And he's going to probably ask the subject to look into the lower of the two lenses on the Roniflex. That's the taking lens. The other one is the focusing lens. So the first one. Right, now what we need to do is to push the little serrated wheel at the bottom of the crank handle here, just round like that. And it smooths very easily, goes right the way round. The film doesn't wind on, it stays exactly where it is in the camera and it cocks the shutter for another exposure. So if you can move back to where you were before, but now look over here. Right. Now we're going to do exactly the same thing again. And then go through, there we are. There we are, it goes around there, like that. There. Okay, now, which way did you look last time? That way. <laughs> so you need to look the other way. That's it. Okay, 
So that's our three-part multiple exposure. Up close. Up close, up mm. close. So the process is actually quite long-winded. Mm. That implies certain things, actually, I think, about what Deakin is doing. Mm. That he's working with people, essentially, that he either knows quite well and a patient are willing to put up with this. People also that are interested in the idea of messing around with the image, mm. of playing games mm. and seeing what chance brings in and this yeah. sort of thing as well. Yeah. It struck me that it's not something the subject would be unaware of. They would be aware that you're doing something different to the other shots, the regular shots, because you would move in a different way and would be paying attention to the mechanics of the camera in a different way. I think it's a very good point, and one I hadn't really thought about quite so much before, but what it involves as well is that sort of complicity between mm. the subject and the photographer, mm. which in a strange sort of way isn't something that you get from Deakin's portraits. Deakin's mm. portraits mm. tend to be sort of hard, controlled, mm. almost forensic sort of photographs mm. of people. And you can see at the time that they were not pretty pictures. They're mm. not portraits designed to flatter, flatter mm. exactly, or impress the subject. Mm. But what he's doing here with this is he's obviously playing with people that he mm. knows he can play with mm. and who want to play with him. It may be that there's something relevant there in the choice of subjects. Mm. I mean, none of the Vogue portraits, as far as I know, are double, triple exposures, multiple exposures of any mm. sort. It's, it's the, in a sense, what well, in inverted commas you might say, the private portraits. Mm. There's only certain people that he felt that he could do this mm. with. Or possibly if we take the Bacon angle in, into account here, the Bacon would have encouraged him to do mm. this or wanted him to do this because mm. he knew that Deakin could get mm. this effect that Bacon was also looking at. Mm. Deakin actually is very good at these sorts of things and knows how to make the image look rather sort of mysterious. What I also want to do is one with possibly a dominant exposure, so you get a slight ghosting effect, which is clear that Deakin is doing that. It's not obvious to me that he's always intending that effect. I mean, there is an element of, you know, the surrealist idea of chance, I think, entering in here. But it's also not impossible that there's a mistake. Oh, I forgot to change the shutter speed setting or something like that. So we're going to do two... We're going to do two profiles, profiles now. Number one. Gonna to have to go again because I've made the classic mistake. You wound up. I wound on, <laughs> which is a very easy thing to do, uh, because you know if you're using a Ronnie Flex all the time, it becomes a second nature. Yes. Click, roll, yeah. click. So it's not roll just on. what you make yourself do; yeah. you have to make yourself not do. Exactly, it's a very carefully calibrated process. Mm. Okay, number, number one. one. Right now, go back to the public exposure. So we want, a, we want a sort of slight ghosting effect. Okay. And we're building up exposure here at the same time. Each time we open the lens, laying a little bit more light in here, so the negative itself at each exposure is going to get denser. Mm. The other aspect of it, which I think is quite interesting, is that these sessions are actually quite long. So if he's got five or six of these, well, there's potentially one per roll, though. So the photo session would move at the normal speed, but then it would be slowed up, I, I suppose, at, what, at whatever point he decided to do the double. And what he possibly did was to play about with it at the end of the roll, or possibly at the beginning of the roll. Deakin doesn't strike me as a person who's interested in putting his sitter at ease. So playing games isn't sort of what he's doing to get them into the mood, I don't think. He's interested in expression basically. Very, very few of his subjects emit anything close to a smile, ever. Um, he's very much one of these people, I think, that wants to see the face as some sort of signifier of the character of the person. Mm -hmm. And therefore, expression, in a sense, to Deakin is probably anathema. There are very few portraits where the subject looks happy or mm -hmm. amused or anything like that, or even sad for that mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. They sometimes look that they're sort of fed up with what's going mm. on, but I think that's really what he wanted.
Okay, so we're back to an eighth of a second here. Yeah. So that's it. That's great. That's perfect. That's great. That's absolutely great. Okay. See, it's actually quite easy to do this as it well. Is. It's not difficult. It takes a bit of... You have to think yeah. to do it. See, one of the things I also have to do, which is quite complicated, is I have to remember what's in the top of that picture. Do you have a grid on the viewfinder there? You have a grid on the viewfinder. So you, but you could mark this out. Now, I think he would not want to do that in terms of what he knew about the ideas that are coming through from the 1930s about photography and about charms mm. and all of these sorts of things. Mm. He's not going to be interested in doing that. He wants those accidental effects mm. to some degree. He wants a little bit of control mm. over them, mm. but probably not too much. What I want you to do is to lift your head no, don't, don't, no, no, it's okay, it's all right. Look, look, possibly just, yeah, relax a little bit. Yeah, and there, look straight ahead, I think. There are other images where Deakin took photographing people in front of a mirror. Mm. So this kind of positioning and playing with both the action of light and the mechanical process of the camera kind of seems to be something that, um, you know, he did. You're going to sit there, have something like that, looking into, no, looking into the mirror. You're going to look in the mirror, aren't you? I want to see the one he's done. Let's see, Let's see all the ones he's done. Yeah, it's a mirror on a on a on a yeah mantelpiece. yeah. I see. Yeah, so her parting is that side. So there seem to be two with that that side. That's interesting. Basically, two sets of double exposures. One is done in the mirror. Mm. That way. Yeah, I've got to get you. Hang on. Yeah, you need to be just about here, facing this, facing the window. Okay, you can come along because we've got plenty of height. Yeah. What I've, got, what I've got to do is work out how I'm going to do this. Because we need a lot of depth of field. So at that point, we need about three and a quarter feet. And the other way, we need seven feet. Right. I think we need F22. Get that. Hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal? Yes, this is what we need. Uh, is that something to do with the infinite? No, what it is is the position between three and a half feet and seven feet, where three and a half feet and seven feet are equally in focus. I'm going to do a double exposure. The slight problem is. I think you're actually slightly too high. I'll sit down and you'll see. And I, it's, it's easier if you look and you can see what the what the problem is. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of extraneous information. In that picture, he's used the sort of there's a much bigger mirror. It's filling up the, the whole of the wall. Yeah. In his picture, so wasn't it? You could come forward to be. I could come forward. That bit. Yeah, I could be in that bit. I don't think it's going to make a huge amount of difference. No, it doesn't. No, no, that's just because it's not a big. We could do a for instance. No, we what we need is a big plate oh, glass mirror. Well, let me go lower. Can we kill the light? Okay. Now what I'm doing is I've got it set up half a second. Right. Number one and very steady. You're going to do number two in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's great. Right, that's that roll. Cool. What I've kept noticing is the amount of calculating. Yeah, it's not an easy process because you've got lots of variables to take into account here. One is this thing about the fact that you're 
adding exposure to to the film. So you need to start with what's the mm. exposure you you expect to get, mm. and then you've got this other complication, which is about well, do I give one of those exposures less time so it's less dense on the negative, therefore darker on the in the finished print? You've got variables going in two directions, and then there's the other thing about where am I putting the subject? And then we've got this one, where we're trying to mirror, where we've got the other problem is, we're talking about a huge distance we've got to cover in terms of the lens and focusing on it. Mm. Now, it'd be much better on a smaller camera because the depth of field is much greater on those than on this. Mm. The longer the lens, mm. the less depth of field you've got. Mm. So you've got all of those variables going on mm. as well. What I like about them is that they are so mechanical. It's a bore and a nuisance at certain times, because if you run out of film, you run out of film. But, you know, the wonderful thing about film is you, what you take on that camera is a physical trace of the fact that you and I yes. and John were in the same room together. Yes. Duane always used to say about photography that it was about putting your foot in the door so chance could get inside, as it were, the image. I think that possibly was what was in Deakin's mind as well. Mm. 